Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome to Conversations. I'm very pleased to have as our guest today, Harvey Mansfield, professor of government at Harvard. And we're going to discuss our parties. Um, your first book 50 years ago was on statesmanship and party government, on the origins mm -hmm. of party government, I guess, in the thought or the mm -hmm. original defense of party government and the thought of Edmund Burke. And now you've returned to parties. So what's, what's interesting about our parties? Our parties? Well, we have two of them. That's a, a point to begin with. Right. The universities seem to think there's only one. And it is the case that in America now there are pockets of party strength for one side or the other where you can live without uh, having to tolerate the existence of people who disagree. But uh, we do have two parties uh, in the past half century or so. Uh, they've uh, divided uh, electoral success pretty much 50-50. So uh, I think they're here to stay for the foreseeable future. I want to study especially the thought that's behind them. I'm interested in uh, what they think, uh, <coughs> both sides, and also uh, the kinds of people, the temperaments that go with being a Democrat or a Republican. So the, the thought. So that's and, different from? The political scientists it is. The political see them just as interest groups. Or that's whatever, right. Or as, right. Yes, as representing different interests, uh, each of them uh, rather accurately. Well, if you're interested in the thought, then you have to, be, have to face the fact that some thoughts are better than others. And that's, uh, so you have to uh, challenge the thinking of both sides and try to see which uh, way of thinking is more viable uh, or which will succeed and, and which won't, or in some uh, which is true and what is false. And that takes you well beyond the fact-value distinction, which um, <coughs> is an affliction of most uh, political scientists. And, and it, it also uh, warns you of the character of the parties to begin with. They're uh, interested in each other. They're not just two sets of uh, preferences. The political scientists like to borrow that term from economics, preference, as if it's a question of vanilla over chocolate. Right. But uh, in, in politics, the people who like vanilla uh, don't like the people who like chocolate, and they want to do away with chocolate. They're anti-chocolate. So, uh, so that's a, a political issue, say, abortion. Each side wants a kind of society in which abortion is, uh, is possible, <clears throat> or in which it is not. And, and so there, uh, it's, a, it's, it's more than a preference, it's a view of the whole of the kind of society you want to you live in. And these two wholes uh, are at odds with each other. And most political debate consists of an attack on the other side. You can, uh, for example, la I listened to President Obama's State of the Union address, beginning of last year. And uh, every single paragraph in that, in that speech was either against President Bush, who preceded him, or uh, against the Republicans, who still oppose him. So, and of course, it's, it's the same with the uh, Republicans. They are after the Democrats. So it's a kind of dialectic. And, uh, and I, I think that those who don't look at the ideas and the thoughts which are behind it or, 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 which, or which are actually f um, fully expressed in it. You know, it's, not, it's, it's hard to miss. Uh, <coughs> I want to understand the politics uh, of, of the two parties. Now, um, it's, so it's also the case that uh, the two parties have different ways of looking at both parties. <coughs> so the Democrats uh, are in favor of progress and they try to impose their view of the two parties on, on both parties in such a way as the, that the Republicans have a kind of mm, diminished role as opposing progress and therefore bad, but perhaps also forcing progress to solve its problems as it goes along, and therefore to that small extent helpful. Raising useful yeah. objections occasionally, but yes. ultimately yielding. Right? Yes, that's, that's their, it. That's and so that's, that's the role of, uh, 
of, of the Republicans. And the Republicans, to some extent, uh, fall in with this as conservatives. Conservatism, you might say, is a, is a little brother of liberalism. It um, wouldn't exist without liberalism to have something to, to combat. And it, um, it, t it tends to be on the defensive. And the usual role of a Republican or a conservative is uh, either to object forcefully, asking history to stop, in William Buckley's famous right. phrase, or to go along and compromise and uh, say, well, we all believe in this now more or less, and, uh, uh, and so we'll make a few, uh, we'll cavil a little, but uh, we won't fundamentally object. So that's the view of the Democrats. And then the, but the Republicans have their view, I think, which gives them a much more central uh, uh, role. <clears throat> and, when, and they are, and, and this will surprise people maybe, I think the party of virtue. They believe uh, that some people are better than others. And this makes them exclusive. Not that they want to exclude people because after all they live in a democracy and somehow this has to be made compatible with democracy, but the, the people who, who uh, earn their living or do better uh, are entitled to greater rewards. And so there's a certain picture of hierarchy that Republicans have in their minds, and they think that uh, our society on the whole is just. Uh, or it's just to the extent that uh, people get the merit or the, 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 the rewards of the desserts that they earn. So, uh, and I suppose something uh, like equal opportunity allows yeah. the Republicans to that's that's right to marry to marry hierarchy to with democracy. Is that yes? Yeah, that, that's the idea very much. So, uh, and this uh, strangely enough, I think this division of uh, between those who are in favor of virtue, and those, well, the Democrats are not in favor of vice, <laughs> but they're in favor of inclusiveness. That's the right. word which they like to use all the time. And that means including the people who aren't quite as meritorious, let's put it that way, as others. Uh, and uh, so th they have their place too, and especially for the Democrats, it's, it's more inclusive to include those <laughs> whom there's some reason for not including. <laughs> And that's, so they're in that somewhat paradoxical position. And so this remind, could remind one uh, who had studied a little bit of political philosophy of uh, the, the view of Aristotle that uh, every society is divided into uh, democracy and oligarchy. And you know, <clears throat> so every society has things in which everyone is equal and things in which everyone is unequal. And, and so, uh, and, uh, and sometimes the democracy predominates and sometimes the oligarchy. And this is sort of modernized or made more democratic by Tocqueville, who makes the distinction between um, those, is, is these are the two great parties in all free societies. First, uh, those who want to extend the power of the people and those who want to restrain it. And, uh, and so the Republicans, I think, look on the party conflict in, in, in that way. And therefore, they are uh, more tolerant than uh, the Democrats. Because the Democrats, believing in progress, thinking, think that, uh, well, as we were saying, uh, the conservatives have their role, but in the long run, they, there's no, really, no real need for them. Right. And because progress means progress towards rationality and equality, those two things, those two things together. And uh, it's progress as against superstition and prejudice and custom, inveterate custom. So, uh, in, so, so, so uh, the, 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 there doesn't have to be, in, in, a, in the final picture, perhaps a conservative party, <clears throat> whereas uh, the conservatives uh, are, are much more aware of the constant opposition to giving merit its due. 
and, and as everyone, it's in the interest, you could say, of everyone who doesn't have it right. to uh, oppose it. So, uh, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, so, so they're not so surprised at the continued existence of liberals. And uh, diversity seems to me to be, I had to pick one word, one term that's sort of the, uh, I don't know, the, the liberals or progressives are for, it seems to be diversity, which is a little different maybe from progress or equality. I mean, or is, is it, or is it not, or is it just a way of dressing up equality to make it look more, <laughs> less uniform, yeah. I don't know, but, is, or is that a way of being, being for many things, but no ranking, no order, I guess no hierarchy, right? Diversity That's is. Right. All that, yes. Well, uh, yeah, so talk about yeah, diversity, di multiculturalism. Yeah, I'm diver just diversity. so struck that that's yeah. kind of the, yes. seems so much at the core. Of, it is. Of uh, diversity is a, is a present day face of, of, of progressivism. Um, I mean, progressivism begins with the distinction between so societies that don't progress and those that do societies that are stuck. Those are, for the most part, uncivilized societies. Civilization uh, allows you to get better, requires you to get better. So they make a big distinction between the uncivilized and the civilized. Uh, and of famous, the most famous liberal, perhaps, John Stuart Mill, right. um, went along with that distinction. He said despotism is a perfectly legitimate way for civilized countries to deal with uh, I think he said barbaric or savage countries, some such pejorative term he used. <coughs> and, but <coughs> now um, um, progress has gone beyond, has progressed beyond the distinction between civilization and, and um, uncivilized, civilized and uncivilized. <coughs> and it did this uh, through the notion of culture. So culture uh, takes us uh, <coughs> a, a giant step towards diversity. And then this culture was a 19th century concept, I, th I think first brought up by Kant. It was almost in the 19th century. <laughs> um, it was developed in the 19th century and then it got passed along to anthropology um, in the 20th century. And it, it, societies all have cultures. So culture is a way of eroding or even erasing the distinction between civilized and uncivilized. So everybody has a culture, and you shouldn't be ashamed of uh, staying where you are, because uh, the the, um, the the view against uh, staying where you are is just a prejudice like other prejudices. So it turns out progress turns on itself, and it becomes more progressive to stop believing in progress than to believe it, to continue to believe in it. So the most progressive progressives are those who believe in the diversity of cultures, each of them equal, because uh, this, is, this goes with the fact-value distinction. Uh, the values are not a matter of knowledge or science. You don't know that. You don't know that, that uh, uh, say, the European Americans were better than the Indians right. that they um, replaced and fought. <clears throat> Uh, so, so we don't know that it's uh, progress to live as we do now instead of uh, as the Indians did with teepees. And, uh, well, they didn't even have horses before the white man came. So um, that's, that, that's progress undermining itself, and you see that very much today in diversity. Diversity, uh, you're right, uh, attacks the notion of hierarchy and uh, even of uh, authority. It's as if a society could be so equal that every opinion that arises uh, is entitled to as much respect as any other and that uh, it can't make any decisions because it hasn't anyone with authority to make decisions. Now that would be a, <coughs> a picture of the sort of final state or final condition of the progress that progressives want. 
they, for the most part, don't have, don't think about this. Right. You know, for them, uh, progress is just more equality, and perhaps at some time we'll have enough, and uh, we'll insist that these, uh, the opinions of this point, at this point, are the correct ones, <clears throat> and uh, should be made authoritative, but uh, they don't know what that point is. But don't you think they, they do think certain opinions are retrograde and not to be tolerated or barely to be tolerated if there are well, opinions sure. that involve inequality of gender, sexes, or yeah. obviously races, or right. other old-fashioned yeah. uh, views that we've moved beyond. So is the diversity a superficial, I mean, is that? Yes, it is superficial, but, uh, <laughs> but everything is superficial. According to them, you know, if, if you believe that all things are relative, right. then, you know, then the preference, that's, that's just part of the fact that, fact, that, um, that uh, the preference for civilization is no stronger, no truer than for uh, barbarism or savagery. So, uh, you know, and that, um, but yeah, I mean, if you believe in progress, you have to believe that progress is better than lack of progress. Right. And that the people who, who join you in this, the other progressives are better than the reactionaries and the conservatives. So you're right, they, uh, they do have an opinion that some people are authoritative and <clears throat> are better than others, but they don't like to trumpet that fact. And uh, they're sort of embarrassed, or would be if they ever thought of it, or if it were ever put to them. It isn't sufficiently put to them. Right. Challenged. They need to be challenged more than they are. And they're but it's, 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 uh, it's perfectly clear in the universities that uh, di diversity means uh, a kind of sameness. Right. At Harvard recently, uh, the administration mounted an attack on the final clubs, or the, those are Harvard's fraternities, <clears throat> as, as being uh, based on same sex. Well, those poor fellows, if only they had been in the marriage business, same sex would have been a great thing. But <laughs> since they're not, uh, to put it mildly, uh, in the business of marriage, uh, it was a bad thing. And uh, the, they were really being bullied, they still are, into accepting women because all institutions having to do with Harvard have to be um, um, a, a mixed sex. or. A, both sex represented, maybe even equally. Right. So, uh, so, so that, is, so that's the kind of difficulty that they get into. That uh, they then they call this diversity, but it's really sameness. Yeah, it's diversity within progressivism. It seems maybe right. I mean, yeah. There's no real. They don't tolerate the diversity of the non-progressives or the. No, they don't. The retrograde. No, that's it. Because uh, those people are old-fashioned, prejudiced, and superstitious. And why do you think? I mean, it's, tr it's striking that liberals have decided in the last few years, I think, to reappropriate and use the term progressive. They think that's more. I don't know. Maybe liberalism was just politically damaged so much, but it's, uh, yes, I don't know the L word. Right. <laughs> yeah. That uh, Nixon did a job on the word <laughs> liberal. <laughs> right. <laughs> it, it came to mean soft on crime, or maybe just plain soft. Right. So, uh, uh, so yeah, they switched back to the term uh, progressive. Also, I suppose there's the danger of libertarians or being right. being confused with uh, libertarians, who are also, in a way, liberals, though usually not called so. Right. I don't. I don't know. I don't know the full reason behind this, but you're right. There's um, uh, there's there is this kind of return to progressivism. But they really want to be the spokesman for progress, right? I mean, that seems important. Yeah. So isn't that at, the, is that at the core of the Democrats, yeah. really, that they, on the side of progress, on the side of history? Yeah. And That's right. So now progress has these characteristics. Uh, um, in the first place, it, uh, it has a kind of political organization. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, as opposed to an intellectual one. Intellectually, um, you can think of you can define democracy as progress towards equality. But that always means that we don't have democracy now. Right. It's in the future sometime when everybody will be more equal than they are at present. And we're eager to get to this future, but uh, it's also important for us to insist that we don't have it now. Right. <clears throat> but politically, democracy would, could be defined as rule of the majority. As each person gets one vote, we're all equal, and, uh, and, and so the majority, as it is now, is the democratic authority and needs to be respected. Uh, and this means that uh, democracy exists now and isn't in the future. Um, but the trouble is that Republicans sometimes win elections, right. so that then uh, that means that democracy equals Republicanism or conservatism, at least for a time, or at least in part. Uh, and this, uh, so that, uh, this has to be explained with something like, as something like false consciousness, which is a communist term for opinions that shouldn't exist, okay. but that somehow do. Uh, well, um, but still, uh, the, the Democrats have taken to fighting elections, therefore. Uh, obviously, and th th this means that uh, they concede that uh, uh, democracy exists to some extent right now, and they have to win the next election, therefore. Right. And they're rather skilled at winning elections. They're, uh, in general, I think, more politically skilled than Republicans or conservatives, which goes with their being a little bit less scrupulous <laughs> than uh, Republicans. Um, they're good at winning elections, and Harry Hopkins had this famous, or maybe this is a legend, but famous uh, formula of tax, 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 spend, 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 elect, elect, elect. That was the political formula of the New Deal, which meant uh, taxing the rich and electing Democrats, and then spending money on benefits for the people. So that progressivism has come to mean uh, these benefits brought to them by government, as entitlements. Uh, <clears throat> the benefit becomes an entitlement when it's yours for sure, and it cannot be taken away. Um, th this brings up this, uh, the irreversibility of progress. I think that's perhaps its most important feature. Progress is progress when it's definite and when it's uh, um, when, 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 you, when one can no longer go back to lack of progress or to what used to be, um, because then, if that were the case, then it would just be back and forth. Uh, but progress is getting away from back and forth to a new plateau above all previous uh, experience. And so President Obama, when he introduced his uh, Affordable Care Act, said that uh, I'm not the first president to, to be concerned with the uh, health care issue, but I want to be the last. Right. So that, uh, that this, this, would be, this would put um, health beyond um, partisan politics, and in which no longer an issue. But, and in a way, maybe he has succeeded to some extent, that, uh, that it will always uh, be somehow the responsibility of government to ensure uh, the health of the American people. But uh, it obviously also doesn't do away with controversy. And in fact, uh, the, the Democrats are very good at winning elections because they have to be. They uh, have to keep, keep winning. They have to defend their uh, s supposedly irreversible progress, and, and, um, which they do uh, with uh, considerable success because these entitlements are designed to be, um, to be permanent in that once you have it, uh, it becomes a right that you insist on 
and is your property, so to speak. And who are they to monkey with my, with my property trying to take it away? So takeaways is something that uh, labor unions know about. So they, to, uh, to reduce wages is a takeaway. And um, it's also to go against the force of history. History ensures somehow, <clears throat> this, this would take a complicated argument, I think, that uh, progress is irreversible, but it continues this way. Another feature of, uh, of progressivism is the reliance on experts. Um, and that's, that's very important. Um, I said that uh, progress means more equality, but also more rationality. So somehow you might not think that equality and rationality go together especially when you consider that rationality promotes experts, and most people aren't experts. They're non-experts, like us, say. Um, but no, uh, rationality will show you that equality is, is, uh, is more rational, more reasonable. It's more reasonable not to make distinctions among people than, uh, than, uh, than, to, do, than to make such distinctions. They'll like it better <coughs> uh, you know, being treated all equally than they will when they're, some of them are treated unequally. Not everyone will like it, but those are the natural Republicans, you could say, those who like being treated unequally. Right. So, because they know that they'll be on top. Mm -hmm. So the people who, know, who might have some doubt about whether they would be on top, on top are willing to settle for equality. So therefore, it becomes more rational to run a political system or a society uh, on, um, on equality. Well, that's just one argument. That, um, in, in general, uh, so, so, uh, so, so rationality uh, is, is expressed in the ascendancy of experts. And uh, the Democrats have made a lot of use of social science, uh, especially of economics, to argue that uh, their solutions to social problems, namely spending more on government benefits, uh, are the best and the most rational, endorsed by the uh, most intelligent experts, most accomplished experts. And they, this is, they've this is particularly fastened on economists. And here I think the the role of Keynesian, Lord Keynes, and, and Keynesian economists is, 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 I think, very important in the history of progressivism. That, uh, Keynes showed that uh, it's rational to spend government money to give people benefits. That, um, on the whole, uh, the old attitude of an ec economist, which you might say was in favor of saving, thrift, Everything that goes with, <clears throat> as, when you say someone is economical or right. you know, economically uh, uh, oriented, uh, you know, uh, that uh, it means so he's a conservative, he's a natural conservative. He wants to save rather than spend. Uh, but Keynes showed that it's more intelligent and uh, even more moral to spend rather than save. I think that's the great moral and political lesson of Keynes. That he, that he inculcated, and, and that, and that I think has given expert recognition to the, to the um, um, uh, government programs of the, of the Democrats, and has been very important for their success. So, the, so the liberals and progressives has, <coughs> it does seem, have created this medley of institutions and attitudes that's pretty powerful: the, the deference to experts, entitlements. Uh, rights. I was at the Supreme Court, right. that kind of expertise too, where we let them decide on family structures, et cetera. And, yeah, that's uh, very important, the Supreme Court too. Yeah. Yeah, the, the judicial, uh, judicial review and the, the, the changing of the Constitution from its original appearance of a structure of process <clears throat> to a set of, uh, of principles or policies even, which must not be violated. I think that, that uh, is part of the irreversibility of progress, uh, the gradual um, 
transformation of the Constitution from this is how you pass a law to these are the laws that must be passed. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, uh, judicial review, the Warren Court, and so on, and, and the liberal position on, uh, on Supreme Court decisions as sort of gradually narrows the range of choice that uh, a free society has. So uh, you might think that uh, you can have a free society with same-sex marriage and without, and, uh, and that that's a, uh, a free choice of the people to make. But no, it turns out that uh, you can't have a free society if same-sex marriage isn't allowed or if abortion isn't allowed. So those are the two most egregious reasons. <laughs> Uh, specification. So, yeah, the Constitution begins to specify things that you must uh, follow and, and believe as opposed to uh, setting down conditions for, for compromise and for uh, moderation and for uh, wisdom. And apart from the fact that people like you and me might not like this vision of politics <laughs> particularly because if some some retrograde views we have or whatever. Yeah. What, what's, uh, what stands in its way, I guess? Is it why, why is it not? I mean, is it, or maybe nothing stands in its way? Is oh, a good it, deal it, stands in its way. Okay, and I, and I think it's headed towards a crisis as well. Oh, good, say. okay, so you're right. gonna cheer me up now, so. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, in the first place, the debt. Uh, the, the, uh, the, just the cost of it. I think it's really coming into question whether uh, the, well, this is one uh, whether the Republicans who opposed the New Deal from the very start weren't right. And they're, right. they're, I think, being set up for vindication that uh, uh, you can't give a democratic people the habit of, of a government that spends for benefits um, without their coming to shirk the duty of paying for those benefits. So uh, the deficit spending, which, which is n now uh, endemic in our government, spending, spending more than you have, right, and therefore borrowing from the future, right. I mean, there's a certain obvious sense in which that can't go on forever. And in Obama's ad administration, our debt has gone from nine trillion to eighteen trillion. Right. Can the next Democratic president do that too? Mm -hmm. Double, and he's uh, used this so-called quantitative easing to uh, hold down government interest payments and therefore make the debt less onerous. Uh, and and, and uh, th now he's just having to move off that. Uh, and, uh, that, that's an emergency measure which becomes uh, routine and becomes expected. So, uh, how long is that going to work? Well, it isn't working. So, so uh, the, the Democrats have been very, very inventive uh, in finding uh, ways to po postpone the reckoning. But at some point, uh, uh, I think it will come. And we've seen that in Greece. Greece is a small and weak country, nothing like the United States of America, of course. But still, uh, there is an example of a, of, a, of a people that democratically voted itself into bankruptcy and with a great loss of wealth now and, and, and lots of trouble. Right. And it's being presided over by a socialist. I think that's a paradox. I could come back to that <laughs> later. but. You know, that, that's also interesting. So that's uh, the debt is uh, is, yeah, and the, and the debt is uh, is uh, that difficulty is added to by the uh, reluctance of people to pay the taxes. So and the Democrats now admit this, and uh, I think it was uh, Walter Mondale in 1984 was the last Democrat right. to run for uh, office, um, for run for the presidency, and say that he was going to raise taxes for everybody. Now, uh, it's only on the rich. That's, pretty, that's always been constant for the Democrats. They, but they, the rich they define as over 250,000 income per year, and that's, uh, 
that's a fairly extensive definition of rich, but, but still leaves a whole lot of people untouched and a whole lot of money untaxed or less taxed uh, below that level. So, uh, the, uh, and, the, and the Republicans too have used that as a tactic. This is their most skillful tactic, uh, uh, the cutting of taxes. Right. In a way, what you might say is irresponsible because they know very well that, uh, that spending won't be cut sufficient to pay for these tax cuts. But still, you know, it, it, uh, it, uh, it, it stops feeding the beast. Right. And, um, um, puts the pressure of necessity on the welfare state in a way that uh, I, I think some, some kind of crisis will come. And uh, it doesn't, this doesn't mean that people will uh, easily or joyfully give up their government benefits. So the political scientists who say that the welfare state is here to stay, this my friend uh, Paul Pearson at Berkeley has a famous book on the subject on the, how difficult it is to disentangle the, uh, the, uh, the benefits that are, and to deprive people of the benefits that they're used to. And that they're, so you, you, know, you won't get polls saying, I'm willing to give up my right. Social Security and so on, or, uh, or Medicare. No, you won't. But still, uh, and th this is one reason why you, <laughs> polls aren't sufficient, because they express wishes and not uh, things that might happen contrary to your wishes. <laughs> you Decisions you might have to yeah. make under yeah. pressure. Or under That's right. right. So, like the socialist government of Greece, which under pressure had to uh, re return to the same austerity that it objected to when it was done by previous governments. So, that, so that, that's the debt. And then the, and another, another point is bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is the delivery system of government benefits. And that um, is incompetent uh, in a word. Um, uh, I've seen uh, recent studies by Nick Eberstadt on, on this. Uh, um, he, he's, he, he, how has the Great Society succeeded? Has it succeeded in the war on poverty? Have we won that war or not? Well, strangely enough, according to the government figures, we haven't. In fact, we haven't even made any progress since it started, say, in 1965 or the Lyndon Johnson uh, administration. So, um, but that, it's a sign of the incompetence of the welfare state that it can't even measure uh, what it has done, and so Eberstadt thinks that yes, it has uh, pretty well cured poverty in the most uh, in, in the most deprived sense of of the word. Nobody's starving, uh, but but at huge cost and uh, with great inefficiency. Uh, and another example would be the return that you get on your social security that you pay, and you get a very poor return as compared to what you might get by inv investing in the stocks and bonds so so uh, and then to the uh, the numbers of people who work in the bureaucracy and their behavior um, look at the public employee unions those are civil servants but somehow their benefits are seem to come ahead of the benefits of the rest of us and, and uh, they've done quite well <laughs> And their reluctance to give up their pensions, their very generous pensions, or even to, you know, reduce them somewhat, is uh, is terrific. Uh, and 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 this sets um, um, a bad example. One might remark too on the general decline of unions in the private sector. This is another factor, I think, in the. And the problems of progressivism. So those, all those difficulties that go with the delivery of the benefits, I think, are, right. are very considerable. And, and the kind of ingratitude which people show toward them. You know, when the government is totally responsible for health, <laughs> then 
you you'll get in touch with your congressman when something goes bad for you. Right. And, uh, and it becomes the uh, it, 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 in, instead of its being the, the the nature of human life and s something that we have to tolerate and and sustain on our own and, and on, also on our own responsibility it's something that we can blame somebody else for and that that leads to a kind of surly disposition and in, in in the people uh, we see this in the in the approval ratings and uh, in the the way in which government is held in such low esteem. Our government is our most uh, valuable common possession, our government and our constitution. Our government is a self-government. That's, I mean, if you have no government, then you have anarchy. That's terrible. You don't want that. So if you're going to have a government, it has to be self-government, and you have to, it has to be run in such a way as each self feels uh, responsible for it. And that means, uh, in general, limited government. The limited uh, comes in because uh, if government tries to take over total responsibility for your life, cradle to grave, as they said with a, well, as a welfare state, uh, then uh, there's nothing left for you to do. And that makes you bored and annoyed and surly. And we see a lot of that uh, in the American people now. They're not as grateful as they should be. So, uh, so, so that's a big, that's problem number two. And problem number three is, I think, in foreign affairs. That uh, weak, the weakness that progressives show in, in, um, in foreign parts. Uh, th their relativism works against their um, belief in American national interest. So when Obama said, uh, you know, uh, I believe in American exceptionalism the same way that Brit the Brits believe in British exceptionalism, right. you know, the, so all countries are at the same level uh, except uh, those who try to pretend to be on a higher level and those you could say are actually on a lower level because of their pretentiousness and of the violence and uh, imperialism which results. So uh, uh, that, that means then it's, it's very hard to defend your national interest as, as, as having some status or, I mean, why, uh, then, you know, why aren't, you know, why isn't the other fellow defending his national interest. Um, and, and so, uh, I mean, Obama can, can't give up uh, the, on, the, on the idea that America should defend its own interest. And, and yet, uh, he, he also can't espouse it with much enthusiasm. Right. <laughs> and so we see uh, apologies and so on. So that's, uh, and, and, and in general, uh, foreign policy weakness and this has come over the prog progressives, <coughs> especially since uh, the late 60s, and the, which was in the protests against the Vietnam War. You could say that um, um, the Democrats have become a peace party, and, and that uh, their, they be their belief in progress uh, forces them to believe that uh, the, the world is becoming more right. progressive and therefore more peaceful, more harmonious. There's less and less reason to combat. This is one, one reason why they're so fond of the issue of environmentalism. Environmentalism makes us all, tells us that we're all vul vulnerable, all of us equally, even the billionaires. Right. Uh, they still have to breathe the air, don't they? And, and so on. So the, uh, and all even of us, Americans as opposed to yes, and not, four and countries. That's or, right. Or, yeah, all of us, all countries are right. Yeah, in it together. Are in it together. So the the, the climate question uh, uh, goes together with uh, peace. So uh, we need peace after all if we're going to work together to right. save our climate, our environment. 
And um, so this, this forces uh, the Democrats to become more and more a peace party. And you could say that we've lost, America has lost three wars of Vietnam and Iraq and Afghanistan, to the extent that those are lost uh, right. because of the peace party, the strength of the peace party in, uh, in, in, uh, in our politics. Right. So th I think those are three ways in which uh, progress is coming to uh, a kind of a, a kind of crisis. I uh, I can't predict. I'm not a predictor, but um, I, I mean one can po point to trends or facts, which uh, can't help but cause trouble. So progress is coming to crisis, and the welfare state has all these these problems that you've pointed out and other conservatives have done a pretty good job, I think, on some of the contradictions of the welfare state, of mm -hmm. modern liberalism, of progressivism. But of course, you can't be something with nothing, I guess, and, and, no. and that raises the question of what conservatives or Republicans are, are for, or what the alternative yes. to, the, yeah. to the welfare state. So I want to ask about the positive alternative to, this, to the progressive welfare state, but I guess before that, maybe I was just, just what's the, uh, the answer to the obvious objection? Well, if the welfare state's supported by experts and it's supported by history, apparently, and it's supported by progress, what's, how does one actually argue against all that, especially progress? Aren't we all for progress? And so you know, if, the, if the progressives are institutionalizing progress, what's the, <laughs> what's the objection? Uh, well, the progressives have stopped institutionalizing progress, and they've become enemies of progress because they have no reason that they can give now why progress is good, since good is all relative. And uh, since uh, one culture is equal to another, why would we go from one to another and with all that effort that's required? So, uh, well, there's a, a Republican progress, which yeah. you can find uh, in a speech by Abraham Lincoln in 1859 to, uh, the, in Wisconsin to a state fair. Uh, addressed to farmers, and he praises American farmers. Uh, they're intelligent. They w work in such a way as to always be looking for a better way to do something. So they make a distinction between doing a job and doing it well. Uh, that's an important distinction. And you can find it in Plato's Republic. Right. That, uh, you're, not, you're not really doing your job unless you're doing it well and um, everybody knows it. And, and, and I think th uh, that's a kind of progress, which doesn't imply uh, that it's for, uh, ordained or, or foretold by history. Uh, and it's w one that uh, goes with uh, the virtue of an individual. What Lincoln is saying that an American farmer is not a serf or a peasant in a, in a, in a, uh, in a a constant uh, uh, um, reactionary society that never moves and never goes anywhere. So uh, th there is that, uh, that kind of progress, and I think that's, that's still possible and still something to be in favor of. And that goes with uh, a Republican notion of, of virtue. You can, and, and, and that's still alive today. You know, if you're a homeowner like me, you, you've, you, you have a lot of acquaintance with uh, workers in, of different kinds, plumbers and carpenters and, and so on, who fix things. <laughs> and th those people are constantly making remarks about the work that has been done, which they encounter. Usually, uh, you know, uh, pejorative remarks, uh, they're, they're quite critical. But they know the difference between what's good work and what isn't. And, and uh, th they can give you the signs of it and uh, allow you gradually to learn something about that. But the, the spirit is, is there and, and still alive, I think, uh, in, uh, in, in American society and, and still very important. So it's now, citizens yeah. sort of doing the work for, for themselves and doing it well, as yeah. opposed to, I suppose, being you know, taken care of by the welfare state, that's or right. being clients, and, uh, I guess that's the uh, term that people use these days, clients of different government programs, and, right. and so forth, yeah. yeah. A client is something like a serf. Right. Yeah, so uh, that's not a free condition. Um, so, um, 
Yeah, you're on the, you're, it's a passive role. So we can be for progress, conservatives can be for progress of a kind, Yeah. but not determined by, or guaranteed by history, obviously. That's right, or, or by society, or by some grand mechanism, <clears throat> or by uh, a government program, which is a mechanism. Right. So, so something that still leaves uh, freedom and virtue. Virtue and freedom go together because you don't have virtue unless you do it, f do something freely, and you don't have freedom unless you do it with virtue. Because if you use freedom licentiously for bad ends, for uh, to, you know to, to corrupt yourself, then you'll lose it. And it is t right. <laughs> so that's it's it's easy to become a slave, even a slave to money. And, and so I think they, the objection that most people would have to what I said about par Republicans being party of virtue is that, no, they're the party of money. And I think it's true that if you're interested in money uh, excessively or, or even reasonably, you're likely uh, to be a Republican more than a, more than a Democrat. Oh, m Democrats make money, too. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but uh, Republicans emphasize that it takes virtue to make money. And therefore, money that is made uh, in our society, they think, uh, is, is deserved. And that this is a just society, except for when government intervenes on the side of one party or another. So that you, you get what you, uh, from, from the market. The market is a kind of uh, interesting uh, thing. I, also a mechanism, a non-governmental mechanism. Right. Uh, and and, it, and the, the market uh, is, is a way of, uh, of, of distributing things or allowing things to be distributed uh, democratically or in a way democratically because uh, uh, y you hit it rich when people right. <laughs> decide that your product is, is just a little bit better than anyone else's or newer, so uh, in, in that way it's, uh, it, it encourages trendiness and uh, it advances in quotations um, uh, in, in a way that's uh, doubtful, um, especially from the standpoint of a free society because it puts you uh, at the mercy of, of changes that you're not in control right. of. And so that, that's, and liberals will use that argument to say that uh, the market needs to be corrected by government. Uh, trouble is that the correction uh, uh, tends to re remove it or to, to uh, um, give you the opinion that uh, no, nothing ever has to be as it is or ought to be as it is, but uh, everything needs to be corrected by by uh, government. So uh, the market is a kind of irrational way of uh, providing an alternative to too much rationalism in, in government. Our, it's, it's an irrational way of uh, accommodating our irrational desires, fashion, style, things, things like that, which are hard to defend reasonably, but um, bad if uh, decided by some uh, authority that claims to be expert or scientific or rational. So the, the market is a resource of virtuous people in that it, it, it allows uh, chance to have its way, but wherever chance is possible, then too virtue is possible. Yeah, and it seems maybe the market's more like a <clears throat> kind of a playing field on which people can at least yeah. take a shot at success, and That's sometimes right. it's, of course, arbitrary or, or, yeah. or good people fail and foolish ideas succeed for a while in the market, right. but uh, still it's better than presumably yeah. better for people's character. Yeah. to compete in the market than be given things by government. I suppose that would be the I think that's right. Yeah. conservative idea. And there's such a thing as character. So and that implies that uh, we have uh, such a thing as a soul. Uh, uh, 
But, whether or not divine or immortal, no, nonetheless a soul that um, identifies each person as himself and on which uh, you can shape or uh, is partly shaped for you by your family and also by your temperament, your nature, your genes, whatever. But uh, you, you can shape, you can control it, and this allows you to control your life. So it's a, it's a character is an, a, a very important word, and it, sh it shouldn't be replaced by personality or self, um, because because it, uh, it, it it tells you that it's within your capacity to uh, govern yourself. We're so now self government working, in the individual. To, yeah, sense, we're beginning right? to work towards self government. Yeah, yes, so self government yes. in the individual. So character is a, is a is a very important thing. And, and how do you get character? Well, um, by teaching yourself virtue, but also by adopting certain habits. And, and so conservatives uh, stress the importance of habits, or you might say conventions, or manners. Um, that uh, there are certain conventional ways of doing things which are virtuous to uphold sometimes to violate because uh, wh what's usually done can get in the way of what ought to be done in an emergency or in a special situation. But for the most part, uh, a virtuous person is, uh, obeys conventions, is respectful of conventions. So it always used to be a, a feature of conservatism that it was interested in conventions and, and in the way that things ought habitually to be done. Good manners. Somebody, you, you show your virtue often by your manners, and th those are superficial, but they, they're superficial signs of something that can be deep. So when you meet somebody, you pay attention to that sort of thing. And that means that a conservative or a Republican is, uh, is somewhat, usually somewhat uh, stiff or uh, uptight. These are, these are sort of um, words that uh, liberals might use, and I think correctly. And it might often be uh, the case that a Democrat makes a better dinner companion than a Republican does. But a Republican might make a better spouse, somebody you can rely on, who's trustworthy, and uh, who won't always be uh, surprising you in a possibly nasty way. All right. So, uh, so manners and conventions are part of virtue and also part of the makeup of, of Republicans and conservatives. But I suppose conservatism sometimes becomes just a defense of the old manners and conventions, uh, <coughs> losing the connection to character and self-government. I mean, that would be a sort of traditionalism, I guess, that for its own sake or love of, you know, sort of just defense of conventions for, because we're accustomed to them or Yes. It existed a long time. Right. Well, uh, well, conservatism has its perversions, same as uh, progressivism. Right. Uh, well, the thing is that progressivism comes identified with its perversions. And I suppose that can happen to conservatism as well, as we see with Donald Trump. Right. But, um, <laughs> um, a perverse character, if there ever was one. <laughs> but... but um, so, so, but the one thing he yeah. seems not to be interested in is self-government of citizens. I mean, he is no. very liberal or progressive yes. in the sense of I can get you a, That's I can right. do better. I uh, can get you a better deal. Right. Than, uh, Trust any, me, than I'll cut else. the deals. That's it's right. not about you know, yeah. letting citizens govern themselves. Really. That's not Trump's vision, I wouldn't say. so. No, it isn't. Maybe it shows a weakness of the Republicans today that they're tempted by Trump, that they don't rebel against it as, well, who's yeah. this rich guy to tell us how to... Yes. To take care of things yeah. for us. You yeah, know? They, they are too partial to business or businessmen and, and making deals and negotiating. That's true. Right. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Not, uh, Trump never uh, volunteers to fight. Right. If, and, and he doesn't use that uh, word which the Democrats like to use, Al Gore, for example. Right. I'll, fight for, I'll fight for you. Right. Yeah. Meaning I'll talk for you. Right. But, uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, he'll, but he'll fight for us in the way of he'll make deals for us. 
Right. Yeah, we all know that he's good at that. Right. As we've, he's told us many times. Right. Mm. So, um, so, yeah, but so it does seem that the Tea Party spirit was so much more one of constitutionalism and self-government, yes. at least in some uh, rhetorically. Um, right. and that I guess one could worry that the yeah. susceptibility to Trump shows that that was, I don't know, maybe it wasn't thought through as much as it, or as yeah. deeply embedded as one hoped, you know, yeah. sort of let's have limited government, let us govern ourselves. I think the Tea Party yeah. is a revealing metaphor that or I, it whatever, is. it's not a metaphor, but a yeah. revealing historical incident that people That's right. appeal to. I don't really remember how exactly where that came from, but uh -huh. so it is sort of, it is spontaneous yeah. action by citizens. Yeah, spontaneous action, <laughs> not very, not legal. Right, well, then, yes. <laughs> Revolutionary. Right, but laying uh, the predicate legal, for a legal, for right. a constitutional system later. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, the Tea Party, uh, um, believes in liberty as intractability. Right. You know, get out of my way and or, you know, leave me alone. And, and, so, I, and uh, so, so it has a kind of hostility to government as such. And, may, and there, this is a definite part of human nature, so yeah. that, that we have a resistance to what is reasonable. <laughs> because a reasonable always turns out to mean some kind of imposition that you don't like and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and just to being bossed around. Right. So I think humans do have this. And then, they, uh, then they, uh, the Tea Party wants to uh, connect this to the Constitution. But the Constitution is a government, is a constitution of a government. Right. And, so, uh, and it doesn't have uh, the uh, set uh, yeses and nos in it, really, that the Tea Party wants. So it makes a kind of direct appeal to the Constitution, forgetting that uh, the Constitution sets up Congress and the presidency and the judiciary to get us the things that, uh, that we want. It's more complicated than, I, I, I see this in the Constitution and therefore I must have it. And that's, and that's what it means. So they, they do have this uh, great appreciation for the Constitution, but it's not a very, not a very profound one. Or, and it's, it's really quite wrong in, in, in overlooking uh, the, the complication or the complexity of, of, and, and the difficulty of self-government. But the rebellion against the sort of nanny state, the welfare yeah. state, uh, right. telling you what to do, that, yes. that maybe is a precondition to them is, yes, returning to a kind say, of constitutionalism right. and self-government, yeah. that would at least be yes, the argument. Yes, an irrational condition to a rational response. Uh, right. Beginning of a... And it was yeah. true historically. There was a Tea Party before there yeah. was a right. declaration, and there was a declaration before there was yeah. a constitution, so... And it, yes, and a declaration <laughs> with some very famous signatures, followed by a constitution with still more famous founders. Right. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> the trouble is, uh, do we see that presently in the Republican Party now? P probably not. Right. And so better to stick with our Constitution as, uh, as we have it. Right. As we have it at present. But and, the uh, Tea Party says it's a return to the original Constitution. So in that respect, they're fine. They don't want a new, yeah. Most of them don't want a new That's Constitution. That's right. So yeah. They need not, to have an occasional rebellion against not, the... Not really revolutionaries. Right. Yeah. Just against the recent authorities of the of progressivism and liberalism, really, in a way. That's what, you know, yeah. you need to overturn that authority to restore the older one, I suppose they would say, right? Mm -hmm. the, uh, so what about self-government, though? Can that be made an attractive program? Isn't it too hard? I mean, habits of virtue, good character, how does that compete with get benefits from government and uh, deferring to experts and feeling like you're on the side of history? What about feeling like you're on the side of history in particular? I'm sort of, I'm yeah, always struck that people want to be. I mean, that, that's yeah. so, it does it, seem attractive to people, yeah. but isn't it kind of? Right, isn't it? That's rather, in, 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 what you're saying is that you're fundamentally the status quo. And, uh, right. History is going, is the status quo in movement or in motion. And, and uh, that you can uh, be yourself by uh, changing as things change. And so Harvard now talks all the time about change. They've forgotten about Veritas, their mo former motto, right. which they still print. But their, their true motto is mutabilitas, <laughs> and the change they want, uh, keeping up with change. Right. So this is the progressive view of the Constitution, the living, the living Constitution. 
Uh, so uh, and to live means to be in history. And to be in history means always to change. And so this word change, which seems so neutral and hardly something that you would rally behind, is used as a, as a slogan right. for, a, for a rally. Hope and change. Right. As if change goes with, with hope. It might go with fear. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's characteristic of conservatives, fear of change. So, uh, so, so it's, it's, I think it's, it's better to, have, uh, to put yourself on the side of, of the good, of the virtuous, of, uh, the, uh, of, of the irrepressibility of the good. Then we as humans always are looking for what is good. And, and uh, that, that's, I think, fundamentally more powerful than looking for what is uh, powerful. And I guess freedom, I mean, freedom, freedom is connected, is, yeah. to, the, the, it's, um, connected yeah. to the good, right? So yeah. I mean, freedom seems Just to be an the, easier the, thing to hang on to than, than the good. <laughs> that, that's true. Uh, and also, there's another word in there, too, the great, right. which is not the same thing as good for some reason. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so uh, fr freedom goes with great because you use your freedom. Right? Good, good, perhaps too much um, limits your freedom or it gu guides it uh, in, an, uh, you know, in, in a uh, compulsive way. Right. Whereas uh, greatness uh, has more of you in it or more of us. So we want a country that's great, great and good. That's. Was, it, was that Jimmy Carter who put those two together? Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. No, you, well, we can't be great without being good. Oh, right. Yeah, that's a delusion. Right. But, yeah, but that's a false Tocqueville quote, right, isn't it? Yes, that it people is. people ascribe it is. to Tocqueville, but he didn't. No, he didn't right, believe, didn't, didn't believe it any all, such but... foolish thing. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, so freedom goes with great and good. Let's put them both together. And, 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 and I th that, I think, is more attractive than freedom as power when power is understood merely as being uh, um, in accord with the times. So, and, and that's, that's fundamentally an unprogressive view. You know, what you're saying is that uh, what is, uh, what is inhuman sort of is, 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 uh, is stronger than what is human. We can't help but change. And, and so, to keep up with that, uh, we have to keep up with, quote, history, unquote, and be on the right side of it. That means on the side of the power, right. not on the side of the virtue. I guess they try to reconcile that by saying, this is a favorite quotation, I think, of President Obama, but others have used it too, that the arc of history bends towards justice. There are different versions of this, I think. But um, So therefore, you can be on the side of history, but also on the side of Justice, not just succumbing to Well, history. sure, that's what they say, but right, right. yeah, that, that, um, uh, that justice, uh, as, as understood, oh, with the power of government right. you know, attached to it, um, is, is stronger than, uh, than injustice, but then uh, the, the injustice is, uh, is, is, uh, lo looks more and more like freedom. As, a, as the ability to rebel or to be different or to be diverse. So uh, people get bored with the kind of good that comes automatically and that you don't have to make any effort to achieve. So, so, so f freedom and virtue have on their side so the, the contingency of human life and the, that, that um, our, our lives are not made for us, and it, it's not good to believe that. And then, um, either as so an individual or as a nation, Either as an individual or as a nation, yeah. Yeah. That, that, uh, that, that, therefore, history, there isn't a capital H to history. History is, is, is uh, at least in part, uh, what we can make of it. And it will always be divided, too, between winners and losers. And um, 
the losers uh, aren't always uh, losers. Right. And, and uh, they can be vindicated later on. Uh, and uh, the winner's the same thing. I always thought Buckley didn't get enough credit. And I think I'm, <coughs> and my friends are probably guilty of this a little because there was something about standing athwart history, yelling stop, that that's, well, that can't really be a governing agenda. And it's so uh, negative, you might say, and out of touch with contemporary America. And conservatism needs to be more sophisticated, et cetera, et cetera. And there's some truth to all that, I suppose. But I think he really did a huge service by just saying that at the beginning of the first conservative popular magazine, somewhat popular magazine, National Review, that, I mean, just sort of the boldness of being willing to, I don't yeah. know how much he had thought it through honestly and how much it was an instinct almost that, you know, maybe he'd read some yeah. deep stuff about the, how we shouldn't uh, be on the side of, uh, you know, that history doesn't work yeah. necessarily in favor of human freedom or that def deferring to history doesn't, isn't in the, for the yeah. sake, isn't good for the cause of freedom but uh, or virtue, but it was striking that he said that in 1955, yeah. you know, that he thought that was kind of a key thing to say at the beginning of... His Christianity helped, I gave him the so. courage to, um, to say that, even if it wasn't formulated. Right. Yeah. So that, that was a wonderful thing, yes. Um, I don't know whether uh, you might say that history is the fundamental enemy of freedom today. Um, science is another one, <laughs> right? But uh, the the two of them get together, and uh, both uh, try to do their best to oppose uh, the the virtue of the human soul. And so, and then it's, it's and self government as a something yes. that's always right. necessary. Or I guess the I mean, the found, so let's just close with the founders maybe, and you mentioned Lincoln, but. The founders believe in progress, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, Hamilton, well, Jefferson, a different way, Madison, they're all progress in political science, progress right. in economic and mm -hmm. scientific, uh, technological progress. Um, yet for them, self-government is an experiment, so I suppose that... That, that makes, makes it, it interesting, yes. And, and therefore not determined. Yeah. yeah. Can we do it? Right. We won't necessarily succeed. We don't know that. History is not necessarily on our side. I think that's and an important. That, um, indeed, history is, history is against us. We're standing against history. Right. The history of republics is is terrible. It's uh, it's deplorable. None of them have survived. And even the greatest one that ever existed, the Roman Republic, became an empire through its own corruption. So, can, what can we do against this? So, in a way, they did say uh, stop to history. And I think. I think. Buckley's phrase is vindicated in the in the founders. Yeah. Uh, th th can, can we succeed in this great experiment? And that's what American exceptionalism is. We are doing something on behalf of mankind, well, not not just for ourselves. Uh, and it's not to make everyone better, but it's to make everyone an example by which each could do better in his own way. I think that's a be better way of phrasing it. It's not imperialism or nation building even, but it's, it's uh, setting an example, um, providing a model by which uh, other countries can be improved. And so that's the basis for a strong foreign policy and still one that um, aims at, promotes peace through uh, the spread of self-government. Right. That's a good, that's a good note on which to right. end, I think, a okay. uh, hopeful note, but also a, a challenge or a charge maybe to yeah. conservatives to yeah. articulate the case for self-government at home, and which is also a case for self-government abroad in a more indirect way, right? I suppose you're saying, I mean, that... Uh, I mean, that would be the trick. But I mean, that we, we yeah. don't think it's just going to be America. For American no. exceptionalism doesn't mean that America will remain the only no. you know, republic for no. hundreds of years. We're the first if we succeed, but others might improve, might surpass us. That's, that's uh, w within possibility. Yeah. Right. And we can help them a yeah. little bit. Yes. Good.
Good. Well, thank you, Harvey, for this very interesting conversation on our parties. Good. Uh, And thank you for joining us on Conversations.